You're listening to Our Space with Matt Batiste. Hey, today's guest has played in a couple of bands that you may have heard before, Issues and 21 Pilots. Uh, Skylar Accord is diving into his solo career, and he's joining us today on the Our Space podcast. Welcome, Skylar. How's it going? What's up? Everything's good. Nice to be here. It's so nice to have you on. You know, we kind of mentioned you played in a few other bands, and now you're kind of working on a solo career. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is this your first time sort of diving into solo work? Yeah. um, Okay, so just to put that into perspective, because I play bass, right? When I was a kid, I uh, was playing in church. That's where I learned. And my church needed a bass player and a singer. And I was like, I'm absolutely not singing. So that's why I kind of (laughs) like veered toward bass. So I'm like very, very comfortable in the uh, in the rhythm section sort of background kind of role. So this is like a new thing. It's a lot of fun. Also, I just realized my dog found a squeaky toy. Yeah, no worries. (laughs) We love appearances from uh, from our furry friends on the show. (laughs) All right, he can have it back after. <laughs> <laughs> so you got into playing bass from playing with the church? Yeah, yeah. I feel like so many people came from the church. My mom and, and well, mostly my mom was super involved in, like, uh, just the music program and stuff. So it was just kind of a natural kind of fit, especially because she was playing locally and stuff. So I just kind of, like, followed her to her gigs, you know? <laughs> That's super cool because I find that uh, at least I found that when I was kind of growing up and looking for bands to play in, uh, bass was probably the second hardest instrument to find uh, people to jam with singing. Finding finding a singer was always the hardest, right? Like everyone had the ego and wanted to be the singer, but like Mm -hmm. nobody was actually, you know, good enough or nobody wanted to step up for that play. It was just, you know, everyone wanted to be the star, but nobody wanted to do the singing or playing the bass. You know, we there was always a drummer and a guitar player. There's a million guitar players. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now that you've kind of brought up the whole bass thing, uh, I did want to kind of talk a little bit about that because uh, when doing research for our chat, I actually noticed a lot of comments online, people talking about you and your bass playing with 21 Pilots and with issues and uh, how you've actually inspired a few people. You've even won AP's best bassist in 2016. So, um, you know, let's talk about that for a second. Like, what makes the bass so special to you? Well, I think, like, I because I, I teach a lot, like, on the weekends and stuff, like, online. And people kind of ask me that a lot. Like, what's the point, kind of? <laughs> and... I always tell them that bass is the best. It's the worst instrument to play by yourself and the best when you get in a room with people. Cause it's like nothing, nothing's right until you get the bass there. Like as soon as you stop playing, the guitar player feels like he sucks. The drummer feels like he sucks. The singer can't find the notes. You know, it's like no one can hear the bass, but everything else sounds awful if the bass is bad. It's so true. Yeah. And you know, that's why. I mean, growing up being a big metalhead and a big rock fan, heavy, heavy music fan in general, um, I kind of paid a lot of attention to bands that had high gain guitars and heavy parts, but really sick bass players. And I started to realize that so many of them were like added in after the band had momentum, probably because the, somebody in the band realized they could write songs, a label figured that out. And then when they're playing live, they're like, uh, something's wrong. Like, <laughs> we need to fix either the drummer or the bass player. Yeah. And, and that's the drummer and the bass player typically end up being the foundation to a lot of songs. 100%. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you could tell some kid right now who's deciding on which instrument they want to pick up, they want to play right now, what would you tell them? Honestly, I would tell them, I don't know. I'm, it, Cause the bass kind of like just felt natural to me, I guess. Just follow, just follow your, follow your heart, <laughs> like go to guitar center, play everything. And you know, if something speaks to you, do it. Like, I'm not going to tell you not to play guitar. Cause what if you're amazing, but I will say, like you said, way too many guitar players. So if you want to be sure that you'll have a gig, um, play drums. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, you know, when it comes to the actual bass, like 
what's your favorite part about that when it comes to actually writing the songs? Hmm. Well, okay, so I went to school for music in Seattle. I didn't graduate because what the hell am I going to do with a degree? Um, and one of the biggest things that kind of came up a lot was harmony and just how powerful the bass is with harmony. So like you can change an entire chord just by changing the bass note. And, you know, it's kind of nerdy if any, any nerds or, or music theory nerds are listening or whatever, but you can kind of take two sets of power chords and play around with like their relationship to each other and like make it more tense or less tense or they're closer together or farther apart or whatever. And just by changing the bass note, you're changing that relationship just completely. So when I'm putting together a song, uh, you know, instead of being on the piano or guitar, which I often am, but a lot of times I will start from the bass and I'll imagine the rest of the chord and then I'll build off the chord from the bass line that's already sounds cool. Like we love a good bass line, like espresso, you know, the whole song is the bass line, you know, more classic, like money by Pink Floyd, like that whole song is the bass line. It's hard to mess up a song if the bass line is already nasty. Yeah. So with that being said, who has the best bass line of all time? Oh man. That's a crazy question. Okay, <laughs> hold on. Best baseline of all time. Okay, so that's that's a hard one to like put one on, but the one on my mind is Sledgehammer. Dum ba doom ba doo. ba doom ba doo boo. That uh, what's his name? Peter Gabriel. You know that song? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say Peter Frampton for some reason, but <laughs> same era. I mean, it's it's like it's our dad's music. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, it's Peter something. Yeah, but I I know right. the song. Um, th It's always the first one that comes to your mind, right? Right. Did you was that one of those like songs that you when you first started to learn that you were like, I need to learn how to play this song like I need to master this song? Actually, no, that was kind of a more real recent realization because I realized how uh, sick Peter Gabriel was like maybe like two years ago. <laughs> But like the music that was like really kind of making me want to make music was, um, man, Mudvayne. You remember? Mudvayne. Do you ever listen to Mudvayne? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that brings me back. I haven't listened to them in so long. Yeah. I mean, put on LD50 and like, it's kind of like, honestly, if that sucker had come out like last year I'd, or this year, I'd have a, a hard time getting through it, you know, because it's like kind of. It's a really dense listen, but um, that changed my brain. Like when I heard it the first time, it was like progressive. The bass was way too loud. Um, and you could tell they were just like feeling and thinking, you know, which I feel like people get like a lot of one or the other. But there's certain parts where you can tell they're just like, what if we did four hits and then three hits and then two hits and then one hit before we go into the like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> That's just, just cool experimenting. to experimenting. Yeah. Just being weirdos, you know? I feel like that's like when music gets to be fun, when you get to experiment. Um, mm -hmm. How do, do you experiment when you're in sort of in that songwriting process in terms of like starting with the bass or are you finding yourself leading towards, uh, I guess, more of a traditional method of starting on a guitar or a piano? I mean, it totally depends. Like, I feel like experimenting is the most important part of writing something interesting because you're going to get bored of your process faster than anyone else. You're going to get bored of your sound faster than anyone else. And the easiest way to kind of hack the system or whatever may, and force yourself to write a new song is just start with a different element and then kind of just play around with it, do things that aren't supposed to happen until something sparks your interest and then follow that path. If you get good at that, then you never have writer's blog ever. And, you know, from what I was reading, you do some writing for some other artists as well. Is that kind of your process with that? Or is that more of a collaborative thing? And you're kind of working within their little set of rules? It totally depends. But I prefer a more collaborative thing. Because otherwise, it's just like I'm writing a song for them. And then like, I don't know, like, how, what makes this your song? I wrote it, you know? <laughs> yeah, and they get all the credit and glory for your work. Right, exactly. I would, I much, much, much prefer a collaborative thing. If someone, my favorite uh, thing someone could tell me when I'm doing a songwriting session is no, I don't like that. I love 
when someone tells me that, because then it, it starts a conversation like, what are you hearing? And it kind of allows the creative to be the creative and think of things that don't make sense and then force me into like a corner to try to make it happen. I love that that problem. But then it also sounds like, you know, they're comfortable enough to be able to express their feelings and their how they feel about it and, you know, collaboratively come up with something together, right? That works for the both of you. Totally. Yeah. And, and like, I feel like the only bad sessions are when someone doesn't have an idea. Like with, a lot of times it can seem like that because maybe they're not confident enough to speak up. And then maybe day two or day three or whatever is when we really like lock in. But if someone doesn't have an idea, then I'm just sitting there trying a million things going like, do you like that? What do you think? And they're just going like, yeah, that's, that's cool. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's cool, I guess. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> It's like, it's your band, not mine. If I'm writing it, I'll just put it out under issues or Skylar Accord or something, you know? (laughs) Do you, and you've written for a variety of people and variety of different genres. Do you have like one specific style that you really have the most fun with? Yeah, well, I'm really comfortable when people want to combine genres. I feel like a lot of people have like things on their wish list, like really ambitious things on their wish list that they don't necessarily know how to make happen. And then that's, kind of where I thrive because in issues that was our whole thing we would do like you know what does it sound like if we do a pop country metal song and then throw like a crust punk black metal riff in it and we would just like force ourselves to make it happen if and if something doesn't work we'd like tweak something you know um you start with the the mission and then if you and land somewhere else who cares it's if it's still sick you know that's really fun for me. And most of the time what that ends up being and what people start started coming to me more for is like really poppy, like hooky, sort of like creamy sounding vocals with the heaviest guitar you can get away with, which is so fun. Yeah, mix of the two. And I mean, uh, in the bands that you've played with, you've done that quite a bit already. So I guess collaborating with other artists, that would come easy. I mean, Issues did a really good job of, doing that i mean you've even played with 21 pilots and i feel like they're so popular because they blend so much and do things uh so differently with even as a band themselves with each album right uh how did you and uh 21 pilots come to be so that's i I don't know the official story because i i never really asked tyler joseph (laughs) but i i was kind of putting things together and i think basically what happened is At the APMAs, um, a few years before I won, um, I think it was the first one, actually, we were up for something and 21 Pilots was performing and our screamer at the time, Michael Bond, he was a big fan. He was super early to 21 Pilots. So he was uh, he was just like thinking like, oh, like, how can I like get involved? And you know how award shows, they always have like collaborations and stuff. Um, he just hit him up and was like, what song are you doing? Can I jump in? And so he ended up performing car radio with them and it was pretty sick. And I think, I mean, just putting it together, that's gotta be when they first became aware of the band. And seven years later, you know, I had no contact with him. I never, cause I didn't even meet them that day. Um, and then at this point, obviously they're like the biggest band since the Beatles. Um, <laughs> but I guess like, yeah, they were just looking for a bass player and they just straight up cold called me. Oh, that's awesome. They were like, let's just call that guy. Yeah, I think like, because he he had followed me on Instagram and I didn't even notice because I'm really, really oblivious on social media. So like, so anytime, anytime someone would get mad at me for not following them back, I'm like, I point to this (laughs) example. Uh, Tyler Tyler. Joseph followed me and I had no idea. (laughs) Right, I didn't even know how to look at like, people who recently followed you until then i'm like maybe i should figure this out (laughs) um but yeah i i remember i posted a video of me playing bill withers and in my opinion i ate on that video and then like a week and a half later i got a call from their manager while i was just like in a target and you know how you don't get any service in target yeah um and it went straight to voicemail i checked my voicemail i was like this is obviously a scam there's no way (laughs) Um, and so I like, I Googled his name, 
like the manager's name and found some interview and was like, well, that sounds like his voice. And then at that point, I was like, he probably signed some baby band and wants me to like play bass for them or like, you know, be the usher to the just new Justin Bieber kind of thing. Like whatever. Some, so I figured it'd be some bullshit. Um, and yeah, he ended up being like, Hey, are you free? You want to play for 21 pilots? I'm like, uh, I can work on it. I can, I can make that happen. <laughs> Just trying to play it cool. Like, um, I, I mean, I got to check my schedule, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the last time I played it cool. Cause from day one, I made a point of being like, yo, like the pandemic just happened. My band like kind of fell apart. I'm just shocked that I even get to play live music on any sort of level with anybody. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to be giddy. I'm going to like have fun. I'm not going to pretend like this is like business as usual because it's not. (laughs) And I mean, like at that point, you were touring with this massive band playing sold out stadium shows. Like how often did you actually take that step back and be like, is this real life? Oh, I every day, every single day. And like, it was kind of like, uh, I learned it the hard way, honestly, because with issues, the first explosion of uh, attention kind of started and never stopped until the pandemic or like just before the pandemic. And when things sort of plateaued a little bit, I wasn't, none of us were emotionally ready, ready for it or financially ready for it. You know, everything consistently done this. And then naturally things do that, you know, they go, um, they, they level out, right? Unless, unless you have, you change something or something happens. And I realized that because I had taken it for granted for so long, I genuinely did not have access to a lot of the memories of the crazy shit that we got to do. I didn't even realize that was possible, you know? So like, I'm looking through pictures and stuff, like, cause I had plenty of time, 2020, <laughs> Um, and going like, oh, we played there or like, what was this show? Like, I genuinely didn't know. So when 21 Pilots called me, I was just like, you know what? Like, I can't believe, first of all, I can't believe I get another shot at this. And then absolutely, I'm going to take it in as much as I can. Yeah. And this is your chance to actually, I guess, kind of remember it because it kind of sounds like you almost let that moment pass you by through issues and uh, you know, I don't want to put words into your mouth and say that you took it for granted, but that's kind of, Oh yeah, know. no, I, I did. I absolutely took it for granted. And it, you know, at that point when 2020 happened, I felt foolish because suddenly it had been taken away from me. And, you know, with the only thing that could possibly have done it, which is a global pandemic, like live music survives everything. Yeah. Like, so recessions, war, like political upheaval, <laughs> you know? It thrives in those environments. Exactly. So I thought I was totally safe. (laughs) What would you say your biggest learning experience would be from, you know, all of that would be? Hmm. I mean, I think that's it, honestly, is is to savor it. And if I had to pick another one, it's how important equity is. Because like, when issues dissolved, I realized that I had a very, you know, like one cool thing about issues and not so cool thing about issues is we split everything equally down, like, you know, however many members were in the band. And that usually amounted to not much money. And um, I realized because we split everything equally, if anybody wasn't feeling it, then someone was going to have to pull more weight, you know, to pick up the slack or whatever. No one wanted to do that. And that kind of created a lot of tension and just kind of gummed up the gears. So I realized that like, it would definitely serve me to while issues was doing his thing. Cause at that point I, you know, I didn't think we were going to be done, done, but while it's doing his thing, I should work on myself instead of you working on myself to serve issues. I should work on myself for myself. And that turned into my solo project. Okay. Yeah. And let's talk about your solo project. You know, I'm, I'm looking at a quote that you were talking about your latest song. It's out right now, by the way, if you listen to this podcast, go and listen to the song. It's called It's You That I'm Missing. And, uh, you know, with this song, you've talked about how it explores the emotional turmoil of getting everything that you thought you wanted only to lose sight of what truly matters. Is that Mm -hmm. from that experience that we've talked about with issues in 21 pilots? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, 
you know, cause I've, I haven't, I haven't gotten to the point where I really have the citizen Kane mansion, you know, like I'm still in, in grind and hustle mode. And I think that like brushing shoulders with people who've had way more success than me, and then also kind of having to eat shit for so long, it definitely helps get some perspective and um, it helps you realize how important defining success is. Because at this point, you know, I'm thinking like my tendency would be thinking, oh, I'm not successful because like I don't like own a house like I'm in an apartment or something. Or it, it could be like, you know, it could be anything, any sort of financial or or music or sort of milestone you don't have. But outside in, it's like, you know, like the people that look up to the music that I make or that I'm a part of, they're like, oh my God, dude, you're living the dream. You're doing like the thing. And I'm like thinking that also, you know, I'm, I'm like a middle-class musician. How many of those are there? There's not a whole lot, you know? No, not a lot of people can actually do music for a living. And like, whether right. you're in that mansion or not you know you're you're doing what so many people packed it in and started selling insurance over the phone instead of doing you know what i mean like so you're living a lot of people's dreams and you know like it, it's you know you can't really compare yourself and that's kind of what it seems like you're you're trying to say with even just losing sight of what truly matters what your definition of it's you that I'm missing. Right. Yeah. It's like when you get there, if you get there, make sure it wasn't at the cost of everything that would have made it worth it is the idea. Yeah. That's, and you know, we kind of talked about uh, taking for granted those moments with issues as well. Mm -hmm. You know, is exactly. That, is that a big part of that as well? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, really, you know, that's, it's you that I'm missing is, a reaction to the upheaval that was the pandemic and the sort of realigning of my life and my career, you know, from like, what does issues look like? What does my relationship with issues look like versus what is my relationship with 21 pilots? Am I a hired gun? Am I a Merc that's going to get hired for like producing a lot, which is like what I'm doing now. You know, it's, it's just like, basically you have a second to think about like, all the crazy shit that happened, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and, you know, it's like Citizen Kane. Like, you ever see that movie? No, I haven't. Okay, so the I first, know it's a like, classic, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first, like, couple minutes, basically the whole premise of the movie is this, like, billionaire dies, and he's in this huge mansion alone, and his last word is Rosebud. And the whole movie is like, what the hell does Rosebud mean? And I'm not going to give it away, but like, it's basically the mess. Rosebud, you know, Rosebud was the lesson he learned along the way, you know? Um, and that's, you know, that's literally the thing. It's like, I don't want that. Like, I sure I would love the Citizen Kane mansion, but I don't want to be alone in it. Yeah. And I think that's a big fear for a lot of people as well. And that's a big sacrifice that a lot of people make. So it's kind of cool to see that, I guess, perspective with all of that. Um, and, you know, with everything kind of happening this solo work right now is that your main focus right now yeah i would say i like it seems like my producing and my songwriting is getting a lot of momentum which is sick but i still have the you know the the dream the like <laughs> solo music dream it seems like this song is doing a lot better than anything else i put out so yeah i'm i'm pretty excited and pretty hopeful it's super exciting. Let's talk about uh, more about the solo work and like writing solo songs. Uh, what would you say the biggest difference is doing solo work versus working in a band like Issues? The biggest thing is the lack of collaboration means that like you have to work harder to trust yourself because there's not, not going to be someone else there going like, yeah, that's a good idea. Do that. Or that part sucks, like work on it. So you have to like really be aware of uh, what part is losing you? What part's exciting? Is there too much going on? Is there not enough going on? And you have to like, uh, you, you just have to like believe in it, you know? Um, but the best thing about it, cause that's the, probably the worst thing, honestly, I love collaboration and I get it. I do it as much as I can on my solo stuff or anything, but, um, without having 
anybody else to slow you down. It's all, it also means that you can actually get stuff done and put it out. <laughs> There's kind of like some pros and cons there. Um, do you totally. ever, do you ever miss that collaboration or reach out to people, uh, to get those thoughts? Like, who are you leaning on throughout the whole, I guess, solo work songwriting journey? Yeah, I, I actually do miss it a lot. I, at this point, I finish everything with my brother, Lofile, um, who Issues fans would probably remember as Scout. He was our, our DJ, and he's since uh, transitioned into being a, a very respected like producer with a Grammy. He won't tell anybody that he won a Grammy <laughs> for some reason, but he literally won a Grammy. Um, but yeah, so fin- I finish everything with him if I can, because like I'll... I'll be the idea guy and then like getting it to sound how it is in my head completely, like from 90 to hundred percent. I have a hard time with that. So I can't get rid of collaboration completely or my musical suck. I just know that. Um, but I would love to do more. The thing is, you know, this project is still kind of growing and it's pretty early. So I can't make it worth uh, a whole lot of people's time yet. <laughs> so What's next with the whole uh, solo stuff? Uh, are more things kind of expected to roll out? Is it kind of like a single? Is it an EP, an album, a tour? Like how big or I guess how little can we kind of expect out of you with it? So I'll tell you the the, the big vision I have. <laughs> so uh, the first EP that came out last year was called True Viridian. The whole concept was like kind of finding yourself um, in media, in art. And, um, this one that I'm working on, cause the, the first two singles that came out this year are the two first two singles from the next EP, which is going to be called true vanity. Ooh. And the next one, which I am like halfway through already is going to be called true violence. So I have like a whole, a whole it's, thing. It's like a, a whole, whole trilogy. trilogy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Um, then I mean, shoot, like, I just have, that's what I was saying, which is sick about like being a solo project, solo artist is you can get a lot done. I have the true vanity basically all done. I just have to like mix it myself now. Cause I, you know, it's, that's just what I'm doing now. You, you got to do what you got to do. And that just takes time. So <laughs> hopefully I'm the idea is I'm turning in the next single like this week. So <laughs> we'll see. Nice. And then we've got another EP to come in the future as well. It's just a matter of of time at this point. Um, what are you most excited for, I guess, in your musical future, whether that's your solo project, playing with other bands? Like, what are you most excited for? Well, if I could snap my fingers and have like my dream sort of set up, I want my solo thing to be the centerpiece. And I want to do more of what I'm doing with producing bands. And I want to be pickier, right? At the moment, I'm like, you know, I like the the cool bands that are coming to me. I'm cherishing them, right? But I have to fill it in with like some stuff that like is still sick because I'm not I'm not going to touch anything that sucks, right? Um, But I would love to be a little bit more like specific with what I spend my time on. And then also have like a little more surplus to kind of like work on smaller bands that don't have the financial like backing yet. Cause there's, I, I get emails all the time of really, really sick bands that just can't invest in their music like that. Maybe they're a little older and like have already done the touring van touring thing. And they're trying to like figure it out or they're like really young. Like there's a band full of high schoolers from Anaheim that blew my mind the other day. And then uh, this other band and path from Chicago, who I think is awesome. Um, they're in the other position where they're all like older and like have jobs. So investing and like coming out to LA is like kind of a thing, you know, trying to get four or five people on the same vacation week is tough. (laughs) Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. But that's, I mean, speaking of some of those other bands, typically what we love to do towards the end of each episode and kind of put a wrap on it is spread love towards other artists that are like yourself that are working so hard. Uh, That's a big reason as to why I wanted to start this page was to bring love to a lot of, you know, artists and musicians who are doing their thing and get more people to check them out. So who's your favorite artist right now that you think more people should check out? I've shouted him out before, but it's because he's awesome. There's a, a guy I play with sometimes. His name is Syak Doss. Syak like kayak. So S-A-Y-A-K Doss, D-A-S. That's his real name. 
he's a Bengali dude who um, is like pretty young and he's an up and coming writer, but his solo stuff meshes a lot of the same elements that like issues did, but in a way different package. It's like way, way more like hip hop, way more like edgy, I would say less metal and more like hard, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, and it's like way more R&B. I don't know. It's just like his stuff. It, it's kind of in. I just checked like before this interview for some reason. Um, and his, he's sitting at like 10,000 monthly listeners, and, which is criminal. It's just disgusting that he doesn't have at least a million, you know. Sci-fi it'll happen, dos. but yeah, it'll happen. But, you know. <laughs> All right. So after this podcast wraps up, we are going to check out uh, Skylar Accords. It's you that I'm missing and Syac Doss after this. Uh, thank you so much for joining the show today, Skylar. I appreciate your time. I look forward to seeing everything that you do coming out with, you know, other bands, but your your solo project is really promising. Uh, your single right now, your latest single is awesome. So third fourth fifth time that i can mention it but it's you that are missing go and check it out is there anything that we haven't talked about or anything that you wanted to mention or promote before we wrap things up fully i think that's it just keep your eye out for more like i got a big year plan incredible go follow him on uh, instagram follow him on spotify as well thank you so much for listening to another episode of the r space podcast and while you're at it please remember to follow subscribe wherever you're watching or listening and uh, leave us a review because that always helps not just me and the show but it helps the artists that we have on the show as well so thank you so much for listening to another episode of our space with matt batisse thank you for listening to our space with matt batisse If you enjoyed yourself, please support the show by subscribing and leaving a review.